Jesus offers practical advice to his disciples on how individuals and the church as a whole should show wrongdoers their need for repentance. Jesus said to the disciples, if another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. The word of the Lord. Be Please be seated. Sisters and brothers in faith, grace to you in peace from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Where two or three are gathered, there I am in the midst of them. Christians often quote that verse. It's a great comfort to us to know that Jesus is among us no matter how small the gathering. But most of the time we don't remember that Jesus said those words in the context of working out a conflict. That's not so much fun, is it? <laughs> Jesus is there wherever Christians are working through their differences for the sake of the community. And I don't know about you, but usually it is my, my conflicts are the last place that I expect to find Jesus. <laughs> but his promise is, that's precisely where we'll find him. I know a devout, um, a devout Christian man, a young man who is faithful and active in his church. One year he was elected president of his congregation. He served gladly at first, but then he became disillusioned. He barely finished his term at the end of his two years, he left the, that congregation. Serving on the council was not what he expected. He, he kind of expected a community of love and joy. Instead, he found a community of many opinions and of some conflict and of the hard work of compromise. And he went to another congregation and never was active on church boards again. It was just too messy for him. Jesus and Matthew seem to understand that the church is not a perfect community. Perfect people, perfect um, saints, that kind of thing. That's not who we are. That's not a surprise, is it? People are still people, even people who follow Jesus. And storms are not only possible, there is a 100% chance of storms, even in the church. And so the question is, in the church is not how do we make it perfect or how do we avoid conflict. The question is, how do we manage it? Here in Matthew 18, Jesus sets some ground rules for us. It's kind of nice to go over them before the conflict begins. I mean, it's hard in the middle of it to do that. But here's what he says. First, the goal of a conflict is not to purify the community, as if kicking somebody out is going to solve all of our problems. The goal is to win back your brother or sister. The goal is reconciliation, always. This lesson comes right after Jesus told the parable of the shepherd who leaves the 99 sheep to save the one lost. You know that one, he comes carrying it back on his shoulders. It is not our Father's will that, that any of those he loves should be lost. And if our Lord is so concerned, so ought his followers be. And the truth is, all of us have been lost at one time or another in our lives. All of us owe our existence to this seeking, forgiving God. And then right after today's lesson comes the parable of the un unforgiving servant. Remember him? The guy was forgiven like a million dollar debt, but he, and then the very next thing he did is he refused to forgive his friend's ten dollar debt. And the message is that one who is unwilling to forgive stands under God's judgment as much as the one who is unwilling to repent. No grudges allowed. The goal always is repentance 
forgiveness, and reconciliation. The life in the church can be a messy business. I don't know about you, but the, my, my um, friends, we always had this saying when we were raising our kids, um, we all know that wherever two or three brothers and sisters are gathered, there will be conflicts, right? But the good news is, wherever two or three are gathered to solve their conflicts, there will Jesus be in their midst. The church is not a pure, perfect community. We're a community of forgiveness and reconciliation that makes room for all of our Lord's sheep. Second, in managing our conflict, there there must be no triangles. Can you see the triangles? The past two parishes that I served were both called Trinity. And just by the way, so if I ever say Trinity sometime, um, it's kind of old habits, born of 18 years of saying that every single Sunday. So when I say Trinity, I actually mean Salem. I don't really mean Trinity um, when that happens. It's going to happen. Anyway, at at these trinities, there were triangles everywhere. The church was shaped like a triangle. There were triangles all over the place up in the front of the church. There were triangles on banners. There were triangles on altar cloths. Confirmation kids would get bored in church, and so they'd doodle on their worship notes, and often they'd draw triangles. (laughs) Triangles also appeared on the stoles they made at confirmation. And triangles are good. They remind us that our God is Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And the three sides of every triangle we see remind us of the one God who loves us, that that God is also three. And community is not just the nature of the church, it's the very name and the nature of God. Triangles are good. But in today's gospel lesson, triangles are bad. Can you see them? Triangles are the way people often deal with conflict in the church and everywhere else, especially in my family. You know, the last thing we want to do is tell the person um, that I have a conflict with that I have a conflict with you. Instead, my first reaction is to go and tell somebody else about it. (laughs) And I create a triangle. Me, the person there's a conflict with, and this other person. And then, over time, I end up talking behind the, pers- the back of the person who did it, and soon, ironically, everybody else knows about the problem except the person who did it, <laughs> which isn't really helpful. And it's a really ineffective strategy for dealing with the problem. And destructive, too. Because how do you resolve it now that everybody knows about it and seems to be in on it? And where does it stop? In a conflict, triangles are bad. They don't solve the problem. And by their nature, they tend to divide the community. So avoid triangles. Jesus said, if your brother or sister sins against you, don't go tell the folks at school or at work or at coaches. Go to your brother or sister alone and let them know what you think. I mean, wouldn't it be something if that were the church's habit? I'm willing to bet that 90% of the conflicts would end right there as two people begin to talk through things. The person would apologize or maybe explain. Each would understand the other. The relationship would not only survive, it would probably get stronger. I wonder why we're so reluctant to do that. Why do I like to make triangles? I think for me, the reason I like to make triangles is because of the 10% of the time that it doesn't work. The person might get angry or defensive or disagree or doesn't care. I mean, it's risky to go and confront someone else. It's easier kind of to hide my cards, to find support from friends who I'm pretty sure will agree with me. But our Lord commands us, go. Talk to your brother or your sister one-to-one. See if you can work it out together. And then if that doesn't work, you still can't go to your friends. The second step is to tell only two or three others and bring them with you to talk to the person. Why two or three others? Well, first, if the two or three agree with you, that's some confirmation that you're not just plain wrong about this. And second, sometimes it helps to have somebody some others there who are kind of not part of the problem and they can see it a little more objectively. 
Maybe they'll convince the person to change. Or maybe they'll change their mind and decide that the other person is right. Huh. And third, it gives everybody another chance to get back together, to find agreement before this problem gets too big. 90% of the problems will be solved at that first meeting. I bet half of the remaining 10% will be solved when the two or three others sit in. And then there's reconciliation. But sometimes even that doesn't work. And then Jesus says, bring them before the whole church. And actually, to be honest, I'm not sure Jesus said that. Because, well, the church hadn't been invented yet. It wasn't gonna be invented until after the resurrection. So I, I don't think Jesus said that. This is a place where Matthew may be talking to his congregation. And bringing it to the church is not like a trial or an inquisition. It's a prayerful, deliberative body whose goal is still to find reconciliation. If the church agrees and the person still won't abide, only then are they to be considered as a Gentile or a tax collector. And even that is not like a self-righteous banishment. Remember, remember, the love and concern our Lord has specifically for Gentiles and tax collectors. Matthew himself was a tax collector. Jesus went and got him. And Jesus sent his disciples to all nations, to the Gentiles, to baptize them, teach them, make disciples out of them. The ultimate goal, even after all this, is still reconciliation. Our Lord understands that people can be stubborn, <laughs> they can scapegoat, they can blame others for all their problems. It's like he's talking to me here. <laughs> and so can churches. And so our Lord calls us to keep our ultimate goal in mind, reconciliation. Leaving the 99 to search for the one who is lost. Forgiving our brother not seven times, but 70 times seven times, as our Lord forgives us. Reconciliation is the goal. It isn't easy, this plan that Jesus gives us, but it's good. And after all that our Lord has forgiven us, it's probably the least we can do. And we have his promise. Where two or three are gathered, there our Lord is in our midst. Can't do any better than that. Amen. Please stand.